All right. Errol, I feel so fortunate to have you on the podcast. How are you? I'm well. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be with you because almost all of the guests that I've had on the show that I've never met them in person before. But I wanted to share with our audience that you're the grandfather of one of my best friends, Gianna, and the father, uh, you're, uh, you're the father of one of my dad's best friends, Josh, from childhood. And my dad always told me how you're one of the most interesting people that he's ever met. So I'm so excited to talk to you today. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to your dad for the compliment. <laughs> I was looking through all the guests that we've had on the podcast, and shockingly, you are one of the first professors, teachers that we've had on the show. And I know that you've also been a successful entrepreneur and executive, but one aspect of your life that has remained a constant the last 50 years is as a professor. So can you share a little bit about your history of getting into teaching and how you've been able to do it even when you've had full-time positions at other jobs? So when I was in graduate school at the University of Southern California, one of my professors said to the class, who would like to not do the thesis for this class? So I put my hand up right away. And he said, very good, Errol, you see me after class. And I went to see him and he said, you don't have to do the thesis, but at four o'clock today, you are going to 8333 West 3rd Street. And I said, why, Professor? He said, because that is the world-renowned Art Center College of Design, and you are going to teach my class in management. So if I can imagine, I was flabbergasted and frightened by what he said. I said, Professor, I'm a graduate student. I'm not a teacher. He said, you will be at four o'clock. <laughs> so I went to the school at three o'clock and I ran around trying to find some students who were in his class. And fortunately I did. And I asked them about his class and they told me they hated his class. <laughs> that most of them slept through it because it had no relevance to their lives. It turns out that most of the students were photographers and illustrators and graphic designers. So I said to them, what do you want to learn? And they said one thing, how to be a successful business person. Well, all the lights went on because my undergrad degree was in accounting and my management degree was in management. So I put the two together and that Eva was 49 years ago. I've wow. taught 6,450 kids in all that time. That's crazy. And I think there's that a really good lesson here. You don't have to just pick one thing. And even if, yes, you do have a full-time career, you are definitely able to do two things at once and put them together and make them something that you love. And there's definitely practicing lawyers that teach classes at law schools and doctors who teach at medical schools also. <laughs> you know, even so, there's a very old saying called, you teach in order to learn. And so because I've been teaching for so long, I have to continually read and learn so that I can stay contemporary with what the students need. So the teaching and my management career and my entrepreneurship career all fit like a hand in a glove. Amazing. Can you actually talk a little bit about the Art Center where you have taught for the past 50 years? Because when I think, when most people think of a college, they think of USC, UCLA, maybe Harvard or Yale. But the Art Center, as I understand it, has a much more specific focus. So what do you teach at the Art Center? So well. <laughs> I teach entrepreneurship. My job is to make sure that my students, and there are 11 different majors at Art Center, my job is to make sure that they understand how business works, and more importantly, how to become an entrepreneur. 
It is the number one rated design school in the world. And I'll tell you an interesting fact. Probably 99% of all the cars on the road today were designed by an ex art center graduate. Even the wow. Tesla and cars like that. That's crazy. And this actually goes with a theme that I always like to share, which is that you can follow any of your dream jobs, even if it isn't a traditional job, as most people think, like a doctor or a lawyer, or and even better, if you are an artist or a illustrator, there's actually schools like the Art Center that focus on helping you develop those skills and finding good paying jobs in those areas as well, right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, Every semester that we graduate, about 200, 300 students, almost 90% of them have a job before they graduate because companies come to Art Center and they pick the very, very best. Wow, that's so cool. Can you share some of the work that your students do, Errol? Because when you think about everything that we have, whether that's an iPhone or a laptop, a toy, the animated movies we watch, the cars we drive, designers and artists are central to the creation of everything we love, right? Well, you've just described everything that has probably been done by an art center graduate. If you were to go to Disney today, you'd probably find 250 art center graduates. Wow. If you go to, if you go to um, Samsung, which is premier product company in the world, the design director of Samsung happens to have gone to Art Center and was my student. So wow. the, you can study at Art Center everything from illustration to photography, to entertainment, to animation, to product design, to environmental design, to graphic design. And you can even study what is called Design Matters, which is social entrepreneurship. So it is a remarkable school and it is well known throughout the world. That's truly amazing. And as I think about it, just take my room, for example. Everything that I have in my room, from my standing desk to my IKEA cubicle shelves to my beanbag chair, they were all originally imagined up by a designer. And I wouldn't be surprised if Art Center students helped take those visions and make them a reality. That's exactly right, because what our students do is they start with nothing but an idea. And a few months later, they have built a prototype. So as I said, the Tesla car, the two chief designers, both went to the Art Center College of Design. Some of the most famous photographers in the world went to the Art Center College of Design. Wow. So you start with nothing but imagination which Albert Einstein said is more important than knowledge. And he's right, because with imagination, you can change the world. That is so true. And I know that your background is in business. And one of the things that you teach your students at the Art Center is how to make smart business and marketing decisions, because you need to put food on the table if you're an artist. So you need to know how to manage your money, have a budget, invest in the right marketing campaigns if you're the owner of that business. And I know that you have a lot of acronyms that you use in your teaching, like FNAFI. Can you maybe share one or two of your favorite business acronyms? Sure. Well, FNAFI is my number one most favorite. And it simply stands for find a need and fill it. You see, in order to succeed, all you need to do is to ask three interesting questions. The first question is, what is the problem to which the solution is my product? Number two, Who's got the problem, which tells you who is the target audience? And number three, can you manufacture this product at a price that people can afford? So mm -hmm. that's what a FNAFI is. Just find a need and fill it. So then students say, well, they have a FNAFI, but they're very afraid. I say, what are you afraid of? So I'm afraid of failing. I say, well, that's an interesting word, fail. 
It's made of four letters, F-A-I-L, and all it stands for is the first attempt in learning. That's what failure is. And the more you fail, the more you succeed, which is what I tell the students every semester. You cannot succeed unless you fail. And the more you fail, the more you succeed. And that wow. sounds crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Except the man who invented the light bulb, Thomas Edison, he filed 102 patents for the light bulb and they were all rejected. And a friend of his said to him, Thomas, you failed 102 times. And he said something magnificent. No, I didn't fail. I just found 102 ways the light bulb doesn't work. See, that's a different way of looking at things. Wow, that is so cool. And big dreamers, these concepts may seem simple, but and I know that Errol can spend hours upon hours diving into these truly amazing concepts. And I know that talking to entrepreneurs like Mark Cuban on the podcast, they will say at the center of their success was a principle like FNAFI or fail. If you're able to see something that the market is missing and provide the, that need, that there is one step towards a million dollar idea, just like Thomas Edison <laughs> and his light bulb. Absolutely. And since you spoke to Mark Cuban, he's the epitome of success. Everything he did in his life, was challenging and he kept trying and kept trying and today probably one of the best known entrepreneurs in the world and i have great respect and admiration for mark <laughs> yes and you actually had a very impressive run at the art center for the past 50 years and as you said you taught over uh, 6,000 students and personally mentored over 3,000 students. So I'm sure that you've seen a lot of students um, in your time succeed and many fail as well. Um, so what are some of the patterns that you've noticed in your students that are successful in achieving their big dreams? It's a very simple word, Eva. One word, attitude. If you have a good attitude, you can do anything. Many of our students come out of school with very good portfolios, but they don't have a good attitude. So I tell the students that there is a very simple mathematical equation. Then they get very scared. Say, don't worry, don't worry. The equation is P squared, D squared, which is two P's and two D's. And what does it stand for? Passion, persistence, discipline, and determination. If you have those four things, there is nothing you can't do. Part of the problem with the students who don't seem to succeed is they don't live up to their potential. All of us have enough potential for a thousand lives. The question is, do we have the passion do we have the drive? Do we have the discipline? And do we have the determination? If you don't have those four things, all the education in the world won't help you. That is so true. And Big Dreamers, this is such a powerful lesson because Errol has had the benefit at looking at some of his most successful students the past 50 years, and he's telling us what he noticed as common patterns. So be sure to have a good attitude and have passion, persistence, discipline, and determination. So those are the keys. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's interesting, Eva, when I was a kid in school, I used to dream and I used to draw things and write them down. And my teacher would come to the desk and give me a swat across the back of the head and say, what are you doing? You're a dreamer and dreamers never amount to anything. You know, Eva, that teacher was wrong. Dreamers are the people who change the world. For sure. What does an architect do? He or she dreams the house first and then designs it on the drawing board. Without a dream, we have nothing. Look at the famous speech of Martin Luther King at the Washington Memorial when he said, I have a dream. That's probably 
a speech that every one of your followers should watch because it is by far for me the most important speech I ever heard in my life. Yes. And it impacted me dramatically. Yes, that M Martin Luther King speech, I Have a Dream, is truly amazing. And I know also one of the topics that you share the most about is gratitude. So you share a story in an interview of a student who is in a dark place and you're able to help him turn his life around by focusing on things to be grateful for in his life. Um, why is it, why is gratitude such an important emotion? And please share a story about gratitude if you'd like. Sure. So we begin with a philosophy of mine that is a life philosophy and also part of my teaching philosophy. And that is, if you don't have gratitude, you'll never find happiness. It is the cornerstone of happiness. Being grateful for what you have makes everything special. You see, every single day, you and I are given 86,400, and all of your dreamers are given the same. And you know what those are? They're the number of seconds in one day, 86,400. But if you don't use them today, you can't use them tomorrow because they're gone. So the concept of being grateful also teaches something called empathy. Empathy is understanding somebody from their perspective. I give you a short story. A friend of mine said, I'll meet you at the library Wednesday at one o'clock. I said, you can't, the library is closed. And he looked at me and he said, no, it's not, it's open. And I said to him, excuse me, I've been there and it's closed. And we had an argument. So we decided to go to the library. What did we find? We found a sign in front of the library, open from eight to one, closed from one to five. You see, we were both right. We just were trying to not be empathetic and listen to somebody else's point of view. So gratitude creates happiness. Happiness creates empathy. And those three things, I bet you if Mark Cuban was sitting with me, he would nod his head. For sure. And it's so powerful, Errol, because my parents have made gratitude a big part of our life. We share something that we're grateful for every night at dinner. And it's one of those emotions that you, that you need to be a part of who you are. And you need to incorporate it into your daily routine because it's a truly amazing emotion. Yep. My students on the first night of class, they are given the following homework. Go and buy a small notebook. And every night for this semester, write down three things you are grateful for. Now I can tell you, I usually have 20 to 25 students, less than two or three will do it, okay? Wow. The rest think it's a joke. But I can share with you, those who do come to me in the middle of the semester and they tell me their whole attitude has changed. The way they treat their parents, the way they treat their friends, the way they treat their teachers, the way they treat themselves has changed. And all because they write something down. And I tell them that if it's a person you're grateful for, pick up the phone and call them, tell them you love them because you make their day and you make your day. Wow, that is so powerful. And it's so true because you always need to share with people how grateful you are for them. Um, so my dad shared with me that you grew up in South Africa during apartheid and you were involved in a civil rights movement in the United States when you immigrated here. Can you share a little bit about the progress you have seen in your lifetime and why we are still not done with our work yet? So in South Africa, um, apartheid was something that I found one of the most disgusting things I could imagine. And because my family is Jewish and from my father's side escaped from the Nazis, when I came 
to South Africa when I was born there and I saw what they were doing to African people, it broke my heart. And I always knew from the age of seven that I would go to America. I knew it in my heart. In fact, everybody who knew me called me Chicago because all I ever talked about was Chicago. I have no idea why. But when I was 20 years old, uh, there was too much political pressure being in the anti-apartheid movement. And after talking with my family, it was time to leave. And so I packed a bag, a very small bag, and I took a plane to America on my own. I arrived here. I didn't know a single human being. I had no place to live. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I had two choices, Eva. I could sink or I could swim. And the answer was obvious. So I chose to swim. But when I arrived here, it was 1966. And it was, of course, the height of the Vietnam War. And I saw the Vietnam War exactly the same way as I saw apartheid. I was vehemently opposed to it and became very, very involved at the college I was studying at in the anti-Vietnam movement. And we marched in downtown Los Angeles and had construction workers throw beer bottles at us and balloons full of paint. And it didn't bother me because I knew in my heart that the war in Vietnam was wrong. And I told people that at the time, the president of this country, Richard Nixon, would eventually step down because this war was immoral. So that's been part of my nature my whole life. Wow. We watched a few weeks ago the acceptance speech of Kamala Harris, and she will now become the first woman vice president, the first person of color to hold that office. So we've come a long way, but there still has not been a woman president. Um, and there still remains a lot of injustice in our society. You are correct. And all I want you to do is reword your sentence. There has not been a woman president yet. yet. <laughs> yes. If you add the word yet, it always says that instead of impossible, the word becomes I'm possible. It's the same word. All you got to do is break it apart. For sure. So I have a couple more questions before we depart, but what is your big dream for the future? My big dream for the future is you, because you see, you are the future. I am 75, almost 76 years old. So what I've done in my life, most of it is behind me. I'm still going to teach. I'm still going to write on LinkedIn every day. I'm still going to do seminars. But my hope for the future is you and my grandchildren, because it is with you and your dreamers that this world will improve. If the political situation in this country has shown us anything, it has shown us that my generation has caused such a rift in this country to the point we can't even talk to each other. We hate each other. We call each other ugly names. We point guns at each other. I think your generation is going to change all of that. And my hope soon is that, forgive me, the old people who are running Congress will become young people running Congress because I believe the future is you. <laughs> That is such an amazing big dream, and we will definitely make sure to change the future. Um, Good. <laughs> for my last question, where can our audience find out more about you? So uh, you can go on Google, and if you just type in my name, it, there are lots of uh, seminars that I've done. I just did a podcast called Contagious Selling that got almost 40,000 views on LinkedIn. That's available. And you can also go on the Art Center College of Design's website. And there is a biography of me and uh, the things that I have done. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Errol, for coming on the podcast. It was truly amazing to have you. Thank you for inviting me. And please give my love to your parents. <laughs> Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.